Hello, everyone. Nice to be with you and uh, talking with you today about dealing with disaster reactions um, and going over some tips for enhancing communication. I'd like to start by reviewing with you the phases of disaster. Uh, we have experienced unprecedented levels of flooding throughout North Dakota for months now, um, and actually in the case of the Devil's Lake area for years. Um, and so we have many, many uh, counties that have been impacted. Many of you have been impacted and your communities that you serve as well. So if we look at the disaster phases in terms of emotional reactions, uh, perhaps you could follow along with me uh, as we look at uh, these different uh, types of emotions that are common during these different phases. So during the warning or threat phase, people may feel vulnerable or not. They may feel safe or they may feel invincible. There are quite a few uh, reactions that folks can have. Um, but by the time the event happens, when we enter the rescue phase, then we see uh, many people feeling quite anxious, uh, perhaps not even believing that it's happening, feeling somewhat disoriented, um, uh, finding, uh, for example, their familiar signposts, um, their familiar uh, visual aspects of the community changed quite a bit. Uh, they may find the emotional disturbance they're experiencing uh, quite distressing as well. Uh, but during the rescue phase, you also will see heroism coming through, people setting aside their own um, pain and their own distress to help others, um, and, and a lot of strength that's displayed by individuals, families, and the community as a whole. This is followed by a honeymoon phase where predominantly what you'll see is altruism, people very selflessly helping one another, many aid agencies coming in to offer support and help, um, and a level of optimism, uh, usually an unrealistic optimism that we can get through this quickly, we'll get back to normal quickly, things won't really change that much. Uh, maybe a lot of gratitude if people are recognizing that their needs are great, uh, feeling very glad that people are there to help them with that. But notice that the emotional line takes a nosedive after that. Um, unfortunately, it kind of looks like uh, the stock market over the last few days. Um, there's this a high and then it drops off very deeply into a low. And I believe that in many parts of the state, we are seeing people um, and communities entering this next phase, the disillusionment phase, where people begin to feel quite discouraged. They realize that um, the disaster recovery is going to be long, it's going to be difficult, things won't get back to the way they were before. Some people have had uh, great losses. If they haven't had great personal losses, they know someone or they're, uh, or they're experiencing uh, others in their community who have had those, so they may be feeling a sense of kind of a false guilt that um, they aren't suffering as much as others. Um, some people just want to get on with life and, and forget about the disaster, but find it impossible to do so. They're competing with many other people for the resources necessary for recovery, for volunteers, for financial help, for um, cleanup kits, you know, for all those things that they need. And because of this, um, they may be feeling a high level of stress. Um, blame and anger are very common during this phase. Uh, some people may even feel rageful. I'll sometimes talk to individuals um, who've been through a disaster and they say, I just can't believe how angry I am, how irritable I am, how cranky I am. This isn't me. What's wrong? Um, it's also common that people will feel very overwhelmed, and tired, uh, just worn out, and they wonder how they're going to have the financial, um, emotional, and physical resources to make it, uh, to, to actually um, make their reality um, come true of being recovered, being back to normal. Um, there may be a sense of sadness and grief, of the, the loss is really becoming uh, quite apparent, 
and people have lost more than just uh, the visible signs of their former uh, affluences and security. They've lost more than a home. They've lost uh, the feel of connection to a neighborhood. They've lost more than um, their financial security. They've lost their, their sense of confidence in themselves. They've lost more than uh, perhaps the uh, the leisure time they were looking for. They've lost um, their sense of of enjoying life. So it's the hidden losses um, that compound the visual losses that can make disaster recovery so difficult. Um, and just so you can look ahead, um, once the disillusionment phase is over, people will move into the recovery and reconstruction phase. And here folks will begin accepting more and more personal responsibility for their recovery. They'll realize that as much help as is offered, uh, it won't be enough, and they'll need to rely on their own resources, their own physical, emotional, and financial resources. And while we certainly want them to accept our help and, help and accept our support, ultimately they are going to have to uh, figure out how to recover uh, themselves, how to be able to rely on themselves and their family. Um, and so as they do that, actually emotions improve, happiness comes back, Many, many people after even a traumatic disaster will experience happiness again and will find a joy and pleasure in their lives. And so we try to help them get to that point. But um, unfortunately, we can't make that happen for them. Uh, they really need to go through this journey with us accompanying them and helping them out. So that's where it gets uh, to the point that I'd like to uh, address with you how to deal with people who are experiencing these uh, negative emotions during the disillusionment phase and then what you can do to help them with that. Uh, before I go on, I would um, be happy to, to answer any questions, if anyone has any, um, about these disaster phases. Okay, terrific. Let's move forward then. Dealing with anger and blaming. So, a natural part of the disillusionment phase of disaster is to be angry about what's happened to you, to blame others. Some people blame themselves. Uh, but ultimately, you may end up dealing with uh, individuals who you're trying to help with your education um, and your other sources of support, and you find yourself met with intense anger um, and blaming, maybe even um, directed toward you. So what I'd like to say about this is that if you can be empathic, if you can suspend any judgment you might have of the person's motivation, if you cannot be worried about how truthful their complaints are, that is, whether the criticism and blame is justified or not, but a try to see things through their eyes and ask questions of them to clarify exactly what they mean, then you can help them um, best by, uh, by helping them feel validated. They'll actually calm down, usually, because they're feeling heard and understood by you. And then this allows you to communicate with them that you're going to be objective, that you're willing to help them, that you're not going to be defensive or judgmental. And once they believe that they can trust you, then they can begin to focus on specific events, specific problems they're having, rather than just making vague complaints. Um, and that can help you... Um, tailor your intervention, the education that you're going to give, the support tools you're going to offer um, so that it better matches the situation. But first, of course, you have to help them calm down. Another strategy that you can try um, with a person who's angry and blaming, particularly if they're blaming you or they're critical of you, is a disarm technique. Um, and here what you're doing is 
Um, again, you're disregarding the validity of the complaint. You're not uh, going to try to judge whether the person is right or wrong. You're just going to listen for something in the complaint that you can agree with, something you can agree with. Um, you want to to then agree in a in a calm and honest way. Um, you know, it's very important not to use sarcasm or be defensive at this point. You just want to be very open, even if inside you're feeling very agitated. Try to take a deep breath, be calm, and try to, in a truthful way, um, find something you can agree with. If you're giving false assurances or you're just trying to calm the person down by saying what they want to hear, that's often counterproductive. People can pick up on that. But if you're trying to be honestly disarming, um, then you can make some progress. So, for example, if a person says, well, your agency, you're putting out all this stuff, but, um, you know, most of it's focused on, you know, how we're going to recover financially, but, you know, we don't even have a house to go back to. And so instead of you keying into the part where they're saying you're giving us the wrong information um, and then being defensive about that, you can say, wow, it sounds like you're feeling very overwhelmed and you're very upset about losing your house and you're feeling like people aren't listening to that part of what you have to say. Tell me more. Okay? So that would allow you then to agree with them, to show some empathy, and then to say, wow, you've lost your home. I could see how that would be very upsetting if people aren't keying into that part of your problem. Speaking the truth, um, being non-defensive will build trust and respect, and um, you will avoid frustrating the person and provoking any further attacks by using this strategy. Third thing you can do in dealing with anger and blaming is what we could call feedback and negotiation. So if you really need to explain to the person that um, you have a, a certain point of view, you have something to offer, um, and that you can't uh, do more than that or you can't do different than that, then you want to be tactful and assertive about that. Uh, strive to focus on the facts, not protect yourself and your agency, not preserve your own pride, but really just focus on the facts. Um, and acknowledge that what you have to offer may not be exactly what the person is looking for, but you're hoping that it can be helpful to them nevertheless. Um, sometimes when uh, we're dealing with someone who's angry and blaming and, and, you know, we're trying to suspend judgment, but we may find ourselves complaining uh, and maybe even using negative labels to ourselves uh, to describe the person. That can be counterproductive because it really um, gets you caught up in an emotional reaction and it, it gets you off track. So try to just listen objectively. Try to figure out what the person is really feeling and experiencing, looking at it from their point of view, and then try not to be um, uh, preoccupied by your own emotional reactions to that. If a person repeats a, repeats a complaint over and over and over again, um, you just need to keep repeating your assertive communication over and over again. So um, sometimes people feel like they get kind of stuck like a broken record. Um, and you can try, you know, saying it different ways. But if they're just repeating the same thing over and over and over again, then the chance is that they're not feeling heard or they're just really preoccupied and they're not able to move on. And so you just stay there right with them and you just repeat your response over and over and over again. Um, and sometimes then they'll, they'll be able to get past it and move on. If not, you can always make another appointment um, or plan to get together with them later when they're in a better state of mind. If you are in the wrong, please agree with the person, thank them for pointing, pointing out your error, and apologize for any hurt you may have caused, even if it's, of course, um, not on purpose, it's not something intentional. But if you have done something inadvertently um, that's, that's causing a problem for the person, please try to um, make an apology for that so that they can see you as genuine and caring. And that way you can gain goodwill and respect. Um, you can help the person calm down and be more reasonable in working with you. And then you can also help them view you in a more positive way. And that can help you help them better. So that's dealing with anger and blaming. I'd be uh, really interested um, when we go through the, the next few slides to take some time 
uh, to come back to these and to find out more about what your experiences have been and what you find helpful in dealing with uh, your customers, your clients who um, are having excessive anger. Before we do that, though, let's look at another topic. Um, and the next one is dealing with grief and sadness. So here, of course, uh, we might be trying to help people who have been through an incredible amount of loss. They may have lost livelihoods, neighborhoods, uh, sense of family, sense of personal competence. They may have lost their life savings, all kinds of things that can feel very overwhelming to them and to us as helpers. Um, you know, our tendency, is, of course, is to want to fix it, to help them feel better. Uh, but I want to encourage you to take a different tack. I want to encourage you to slow down, to try to just be present with the person in their grief and sadness and to validate their loss, uh, to really uh, let them know that you uh, can understand uh, at a very human level how they might be experiencing life as very difficult and very sad and very overwhelming right now. Um, and that that makes sense to you, that you hear that, that you can validate that. Um, in, our, in our part of the world, um, and particularly with some of the, um, the sub-cultural expectations we have, I'm thinking maybe of you know, small towns and, and ag communities and the like, um, people are very protective of, um, of revealing problems, of re revealing distress to other people. Um, but I'm guessing that many of you are trusted confidants, and, and if not, that you may find yourself in the role of a trusted confidant, someone uh, who, who, to whom you know, the sadness can be revealed, the grief can be revealed, the tears can be shed. Um, and you want to be, you want to try to nurture yourself, help yourself be able to hear that, be able to sit with that without rushing to feel like you have to say something. In fact, our second tip is instead of trying to say something, um, your role now that would be most helpful is really to listen, to do compassionate listening. Um, to listen, to um, if, you, if you feel comfortable, uh, you know, you can put your hand on the person's arm or, uh, or, or shake their hand as they leave or do something to help them um, feel a sense of connection and um, a, a sense that you, you truly care. You know, look at them, um, lean forward. Um, try not to uh, look tense. Try to relax your body as much as you can. But if you're feeling sad along with them, that's okay. Uh, you can look sad. You don't have to be all cheery and make a joke. However, sometimes they all want to make jokes and move in that direction. That's okay, too. So you can just follow their lead, but you want to be listening. You want to, to listen with concern and with compassion. And then um, you want to help them feel connected to you and feel connected to others. Notice in none of this am I saying you really need to fix it for them. Because I really believe that first people need to feel their sadness and their grief and then be able to, to get to a place where they can tr uh, be ready to fix it, be ready to recover. And we don't want you to rush them too much. Um, now, uh, you may not be happy with me for saying that. Uh, it may be very different from what you normally do. And if it doesn't work, if you tried it and it doesn't work, I'd like to hear about that uh, because I don't have your job. I'm just saying that uh, when I've worked with people post-disaster, I discovered that many of them need fresh ears that can listen. They've had um, plenty of, of time that they've tried to withhold their feelings and withhold their, um, their thoughts from, pe from others, either because they don't want to um, you know, be thought of as weak or they don't want to be pitied, but also um, because they don't want to burden others with their problems and concerns. They may feel like they can burden you. And if you're willing to accept that by just listening um, and appreciating um, what they're telling you and how, uh, it, how heavy it feels to them, that can be very helpful and then that can actually get them ready to move forward with recovery. The social connection has to do with making sure that they're tied in as much as they can be with people in their lives who are support, 
support, supportive to them. So family, friends, church, um, are they going back to the cafe uh, and hanging out? Are they hanging out at the, at the elevator again? Are they, uh, you know, presuming that that's available to them? Are they, um, are they uh, going to, uh, to the quilting group? Um, you know, so are they doing the social things? that provide them that support that they get from hanging out with their peers, people who care for them. Often in, in the rush of trying to um, respond and recover from disaster, people let these social connections uh, fade away. They don't um, attend to them as much. They don't nurture their friendships. They don't uh, make time for this, for this uh, relaxation and recreation um, and, and worship and that kind of stuff. But um, if that's been an important part of their past, that can really help them connect with others and get some support with their grief and their sadness. Last topic I want to touch on briefly, um, and then we can open it up for some discussion, is dealing with discouragement. So with discouragement, um, I'm talking about people feeling hopeless and helpless, like they can't move forward. They don't know how they're going to deal with this. Um, and an important thing that you can begin to do is to foster hope. Help them find hope. Now, hope doesn't have to be, um, you know, I hope that everything will be back the way it was. I hope that someday, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be all recovered and, you know, we'll be back to normal and this will just be a distant memory. Um, because those kinds of things may or may not be achievable. But for hope, to foster hope, well, now what we're looking at is fostering hope that you can cope, fostering hope that you can begin your recovery or proceed with your recovery, fostering hope that you can build a new life for yourself and your family. So how do you foster that kind of hope? Well, what might be really helpful is to remind people that they've been through tough times before and to ask them what they did then to deal with that situation. What did you do before when you were facing a financial crisis? What did you do before when you noticed that you were not able to, um, to have um, the kind of living situation you wanted? What did you do before when your child had to change school and so forth? Um, how did you deal with that then? What can you do now um, to cope with it better? Um, so getting them in touch with their own past can foster hope for the future. Um, another source of fostering hope, of course, is that you have information, you have uh, resources available to them, and you can let them know that they are not forgotten, they're not going to have to struggle with this alone, that there will be others to help, including you and your agency and any others that you're aware of that can provide that kind of support. So you want to give them hope that they can cope. You also want to help them engage in problem solving. And if people get overwhelmed and are feeling helpless, often they're not engaging in good problem solving. Um, and so you can guide them. Um, how do you do good problem solving? Just think of these simple steps. First, you have to know what the problem is, right? Um, and it can't be the whole thing. The problem is I've got to get over this disaster or we've got to, um, you know, we've got to recover. It, it, that's too vague. It has to be more specific. We've got to figure out where we're going to live. I've got to figure out um, how we're going to handle this financially, right? So that would be the problem. And then once you have identified a very discrete problem, then you want to engage in free non-judgmental brainstorming, right? What are the different options available? What are some possibilities? Even wild ones um, that most people uh, would censor, uh, like, well, I could just, um, you know, I could just um, go back to school and become a clown or something. You know, um, that's a funny example, but, you know, coming up with some brainstorming, really thinking outside the box. I know you guys are great at being creative and thinking and pulling resources together. And so problem solving would be a great thing for you to do because you know what many, many options might be. And see if you and the person together can't throw out a whole bunch of them. And then once you've thought through uh, or thrown out a bunch, then begin to evaluate them and try to select um, options that are realistic given the person's current situation. 
Um, and once you've identified some realistic options, you may just choose one or you may choose uh, several that you want to combine. Or, or I actually like to work with people on problem solving in stages. So let's problem solve for this week. Um, and then once we've solved this week, then we can look ahead to next month. And then we might be able to look ahead further, right? So you might want to do it in terms of a temporal continuum like that. Have a, a clear plan of action that the person can uh, get started with right away. And this can help with kind of the third um, step, which is enhancing a sense of control. Having a plan and having something you can do right now, right now as you're sitting together, right now as you're meeting together, right now as soon as you leave this appointment, you can go over to XYZ place and register or request or purchase, you know, whatever it might be. You can go online and find ABC resource, right? You can put something in their hand, and that can increase their sense of control. Oh, now I have a plan. Now I have something I can do to move forward in the direction I want to go. And that can help counteract those, that discouragement, those feelings of hopelessness and hopelessness uh, by giving the person, again, a chance to, um, to make a little difference. Um, remember that any journey starts with one step, right? So we're not talking about that you have to problem solve and get everything all resolved. We're not talking about the person has to feel perfectly back in control of their lives. You just want to enhance that sense of control, the confidence that they can do something, the self-efficacy that what they do will make a difference and help counteract that discouragement. Thank you so much for listening for a while. I hope you've found this um, interesting and, and thought-provoking. And now let's, let's talk a bit. Um, I'm interested in your questions and learning more about strategies that work for you or, or any particular concerns that you might have. So go ahead and type them in the text chat or press the talk button and ask away. I'm listening. While we're waiting for questions, I have some more slides and we can just kind of talk a little bit about some things if you'd like. Let's look at this one. This is a Minot picture. Um, and notice that what we have is uh, people in an uncustomary form of transpor transportation, right? They're actually in a boat going through neighborhoods, and you can see in the background the homes that are flooded. So when you look at a picture like that, perhaps like me, you think, that doesn't even look real. How could that be? And how overwhelming what it would be, uh, how overwhelming it would be to face that. Um, let's, look at, let's think about this in the context of Lori's question. Um, and she asked, the survivors are so ready to do something, but the answers on rebuilding are so unanswered, the frustration of not being able to move forward. So think about the enormity of it. And you look at these homes and imagine now the water has gone down, and here we are um, with the, the remains of these homes, right? Um, and it's been weeks now, and people want to move forward and there are no answers. There are no answers. So let's think about that. You might, of course, want to be the answer person. You might want to help them find the answers. If there are no answers there, everybody's frustrated. Everybody's frustrated. So let's look back then and think about our, the things that we could do. One is we might want to validate that frustration, right? Yes, that is very frustrating, isn't it? 
you would expect by now that things would be solved, that decisions would be made, that um, the future would appear clear, and it and it isn't. Um, I'm just going to – we'll just think back about the anger and blaming. So having some empathy, yes, that's very frustrating. Um, what do you see as, you know, the main barriers to moving forward? And then you may be able to get the person to talk about, uh, well, I think it's, you know – uh, this agency or that agency hasn't made the decision. Or they may say, oh, because I think it's so overwhelming. You know, there's just too many decisions to be made. Um, and then you can say, all right, given that the decisions aren't made yet and that you don't know ultimately what the answer will be for you, what's one thing you can do now? What's one thing you can do now? Because being frustrated about something that you you aren't able to control um, will will just lead you to be um, more and more upset over time, right? So let's see if we can find there are some things that you can control now. You, maybe you can't control what the city is going to do, what the codes are going to be, what the ultimate plan is going to be. Maybe you can have some input. You know, have you thought about talking to your, you know, county commissioner or your emergency manager or whatever? Have you thought about doing that? Would that be something that would be helpful to you? Have you thought about writing a letter to the editor? Um, but let's say that, you know, that, that that isn't a direction you want to go. What can you do now to cope with your frustration? Because if you can't control the circumstances, you can control how you react. So what are you going to do to cope with your frustration? Maybe it means not thinking about it and talking about it as much, right? Maybe it means thinking about taking a break. Um, I have... Um, Friends of mine, many of us do, right? And and my friends decided that they were going to take a little vacation now because there's nothing they can do for a while. So they have some friends um, who are giving them a place to stay in Florida, and they're going to go away for a few days um, and just kind of hang out. I talked to other friends that said, oh, they're going to go visit relatives for a while. Um, so maybe this is a good time to just kind of take a break and nurture and take care of yourself while you're waiting for some decisions to be made. So thank you, Lori, for asking that question. Um, any other questions that people have? Anybody interested in sharing more about what they're seeing out there? <laughs> Quiet shy group. Let's talk some let's talk some about some of the situations. Um, yeah. So here we have um you know the flood, mud and crud, the aftermath of the flooding. And Lori's commenting that some people are dealing very well and some are not handling it well at all. Um and so I imagine the people that are dealing well uh, are people that are resilient, right? They're finding uh, some way to have hope in the future. They're trying to maintain some sense of optimism. Um, they're connecting with other people. They have a plan. They're trying to work their plan, and their plan uh, can be flexible. Uh, maybe they're setting new goals for themselves, um, or, or they're able to revise their goals and move forward. Other people will feel um, very overwhelmed, like um, they really don't know what to do. It's so much has gone wrong all at once, and they're just not sure where to start. Um, and maybe they've experienced the loss of some really significant items. Uh, you know, here we see just kind of strewn about things that have come out of people's homes. And many of those items, of course, um, are contaminated and destroyed and can't be salvaged. Uh, people will try to salvage them sometimes, but eventually they'll they'll realize it's a losing battle. And now they're without their sentimental items. They're without those 
things that are irreplaceable, um, and that can cause a lot of pain and a lot of grief. Um, and so not handling it well um, may mean that people are overwhelmed by the emotional aspects of it. So if we think about how to help people that are overwhelmed emotionally, um, mostly it's what, uh, you know, it's, it's back to uh, what we were talking about earlier, maybe the grief and the sadness. Um, it's validating. It's compassionate listening. It's helping people get connected with others um, so that they can get some hope um, that they may be able to somehow get through this, even if it means a lot of them um, are not going to have ever returned to life the way it was before. Um, change is really part of life, and um, helping ourselves adapt well to changes, even when they're negative changes, is something we all can work on. Um, let's think also... Um, thank you, Mike. Uh, let's talk a little bit about if we're helping other people, um, how do we cope with it ourselves? How do we cope with the stress of helping the people um, that are looking to us? Um, if we're meeting with, with folks that have um, this kind of emotional um, expression on their face, you know, like this man here, uh, this is a a picture from Gulf Coast, but uh, post Hurricane Katrina, that you can see the the hopelessness, the discouragement, the the kind of lost look in this man's eyes. If we're dealing with many people every day that have that, um, the stress is going to take a toll on us too. And so, what is so important is for us to uh, to to validate that ourselves. Okay, it is going to be stressful. It is going to be hard. It's going to be painful we are going to react emotionally to the stories we hear. And so we need to do some special things to help ourselves stay healthy, to help ourselves be resilient as we're doing this. Um, and those come under the realm of self-care. Self -care. Um, let's think about um, different realms of self-care. Let's think for a moment about caring for ourselves physically. Rest and sleep are critical. We need to recharge our batteries. We need to restore the lost energy. So we need to take time for rest. We certainly need to take time for sleep. Sometimes we'll be reluctant to do that because there's so much to do. Or when we lie down, we have these images and thoughts going through our head and we're not able to sleep. So let's talk a little bit about sleep hygiene to make sure that we can do that. Um, to help yourself have a good night's sleep, you want to make sure you're taking time before bed to turn off your brain, at least to um, turn your brain to a different channel. So if you've been, uh, if you're like me and you're kind of in the habit of watching the nightly news program right before bed, this may not be a good time to be doing that. Um, you can always catch the news in the morning. Um, and you probably don't need to hear more about pain and suffering in the world uh, right before you're trying to sleep. So turn off the TV, turn on some music. Or if you are watching TV, turn to watch something humorous or something very light. Um, or maybe, you know, you've got some favorite uh, DVDs that you can, you know, pop in a DVD or something. I like to watch British comedy. That really helps me at nighttime. So I'm going through, again, the series Faulty Towers. Uh, to kind of help me uh, to do a bit of laughing um, and and relax so I can get a good night's sleep. You also want to uh, watch your use of caffeine uh, because when we get tired and we're not sleeping well, we tend to overuse caffeine the next day to try to help ourselves be alert, uh, but we want to be careful about that. So rest and sleep. Secondly, think about good nutrition uh, we might go for comfort food, but, you know, comfort food works in the short run and in the long run isn't the best thing. So I know many of you out there um, are, are experts at nutrition. You know, think about applying that yourselves and, and encouraging your colleagues to, to use good nutrition. And then finally, calming your mind. And so we want you to, to help you be able to release the stories that you've heard, not carry them home with you, um, uh, but really just kind of leave them there. And so 
um, you know, if you're a spiritual person, um, it might help you uh, to do a little prayer or a little meditation at the end of your work day to just kind of help yourself relax and calm down and to leave leave um, the people's problems that they've given to you to hold, to put them in a place for safekeeping, but not to just carry them home uh, with you and have them um, interrupt your your need for uh, rest and, and relaxation in the evening. You also might um, do a bit of journaling or have a colleague that you can talk to if you've had a particularly upsetting story or an upsetting day. Uh, try to uh, unload that on someone who will listen compassionately to you and not try to sit uh, but will really give you some support, validate that, yes, this is a tough day, but then help you uh, find your own resilience, remind you that that you're not there to solve everyone's problems. You can't be um, the solution person for everyone and for everything. All you can do is provide your little bit of expertise, your little bit of help, um, and that that truly can make a big difference for people. Um, so remembering that what you do is very important, but you don't have to do everything. Um, two two catchphrases with this that I've learned recently that I really like. Um, you may be able to do many things, but you can't do everything. You can do maybe anything, but you can't do everything. And the other one is, you know, your best is all you can do. That really is all you can do. So do your best and then be willing to walk away and leave it at the office um, Leave it on your um, your notepad. Leave it in. I have a worry jar in my office, and I, my clients certainly use it. But sometimes I use it too. Leave your worries behind, um, and they'll be there for you to pick up when you're fresh and rested tomorrow. Thank you, Mike, for asking. Hi, this is Holly. I just had a comment. Um, I was helping a friend last night, and I just made a point of saying when I entered her basically dilapidated, gutted out house, I said, wow, you're just it's amazing how far you've come. And later in the evening, she said, you know, she goes, I just feel really good about all that I've accomplished. I never worked so hard in my life. She goes, and I did it. I did it, and my friends did it. She goes, and that just feels really good. So even in, in the midst of this devastation, just talking about how empowered she feels on one hand, how devastating it is on the other, but just really trying to focus on, you know, really how far people have come, even though it may seem like they're going backwards in a lot of ways, but she's just really feeling good about her support system right now and what she's capable of. And I think sometimes we forget that, you know, I, th- I think people can do a lot more than we think we can when we're, when we need to. Thank you so much for that comment. That's, that's just awesome to hear that. Um, because what you've identified is that you were able, through you know, your compliment, um, you were able to help her recognize her own resilience um, and that she could find strength within herself, maybe that she didn't even know she had, right? And that she found um, strength in her support and people to help her that she didn't even know were there. Um, Part of uh, my professional life is doing research post-disaster and and asking people to think back over their disaster experience um, and what advice they might give other people or other communities facing disaster. And fairly frequently, people will say, I discovered strength I didn't know I had, or I discovered that I could do things I never imagined, or I discovered that, you know, who my true friends are. (laughs) I discovered how strong my community is. I discovered that although this is very difficult to live here and to have this, you know, disaster impact us, and sometimes again and again, or maybe for a long time, nevertheless, there are so many good people here, and um, this is why I'm here. This is why I feel connected uh, to my community. Uh, So, yes, there always is... um, I, I, you know, the, the sun, it, it still shines, even though there's dark clouds, right? The sun is still there. And if you can help people find the sun, find that ray of hope, that gleam of, of joy, that, that bit of warmth and comfort, um, then they can do better emotionally, and that will also help them do better um, you know, physically and socially and occupationally and financially. It's a, it's a ripple effect.
So uh, let me pass on then, um, just in closing, some some comments. I, Deb has, has mentioned that um, we've gone over some information. There's lots to think about, um, and you know, she's encouraging you to use these tips and reminders and really take a, a pause today just to think about are there any ways you want to adjust your own communications with clients who need your support? Um, what have you done lately to take care of yourself? What are you doing that's working? Um, you know, when I, when I give you these tips and pointers, um, I'm trying to point out uh, some strategies that you may not have thought of, but I'm aware that many of you are already using these things and you've already thought of them. And I, I want you to, to uh, pat yourselves on the back, give yourself a, a chance to recognize um, that you've been doing some really good work out there. Um, and hopefully, uh, just going over some basic things you can do to help people that are feeling stressed, angry, discouraged, sad, grieving, uh, going over those uh, tips for communication can help you feel more successful when you're dealing with them. So, so thank you, um, all of you, for all that you do. And um, just want to remind you here that we know things will get better. That is, um, that's what happens. Uh, life produces changes, and we ad ad adapt to them and adjust to them as best we can. But even in the worst situation, um, there's a way to look forward to see that something uh, will get better. And in many cases, post-disaster, a lot of things get better. Um, so have hope in that. Look toward the future. Find that sunshine and take care of yourself. I think I'm all set. Thank you so much, everybody.